Morning! Hope you're doing really, really well. It's November and the race that I've been looking forward to for the last half a year is suddenly looming. I'm talking about a Cross Andy's bike race, which is going to be my first bike packing ultra distance race. It's a thousand kilometres, we go from Chile to Argentina over the Andes. It's going to be amazing and I am so, so excited. But I'm also quite nervous because I struggled a lot um, before migration gravel race in Kenya. I, I really, really got into a massive panic before I set off. So much so that, I mean, I'd lost everything and I just, I mean, it was, yeah, it was hard. And so I am worried about what's gonna happen when I touch down in Chile and I have to get myself together and get started on this race. It's not the cycling that I find a problem, it's what comes before it, the bit before you actually get on your bike. And uh, I think it figured it'd be interesting to talk to you guys about this because it's not really something I've delved into before and you almost certainly don't know my history um, surrounding this sort of issue of sports psychology. So, in very good timing, uh, Mark Beaumont, the amazing ultra-distance cyclist who has cycled around the world, um, won numerous world records and done GB Duro, in short, a very amazing guy whose books I really enjoy reading, Mark Beaumont has collaborated with GCN to produce a book that focuses in on cycling psychology and mental training and stuff like that, so perfect timing, I figured, I would get him on Zoom and I would chat to him about my worries for the Across Andes bike race and hopefully get some insights and also show you the book. Before I do that, I just want to explain more about how I struggle with this sort of thing. So hopefully I can make um, you understand why I'm doing this. Rewind many, many, many years and uh, I used to be a pro snowboarder. And I really enjoy snowboarding. I really enjoy doing massive jumps, like 720s, riding half pipe. I used to compete in big air, but a massive problem for me was um, nerves around competitions. And in fact, the reason I quit being a pro snowboarder was because I started panicking so badly about competing that it basically ruined snowboarding for me. Um, I went to see a, hypno a hypnotherapist to try and get some help to um, um, basically switch off this fear that I was having. And it's weird because it wasn't a fear about, say, doing a trick that involves spinning around over a giant jump. It was something else. Um, and so I went to have hypnosis to try and help me deal with this irrational sort of fear and uh, it didn't help at all, just didn't help, I thought it was absolutely rubbish and so ultimately I quit snowboarding because I couldn't get a grip of, of my, my nerves, I couldn't um, calm my mind and focus on the parts that I really enjoyed, i.e. doing the big tricks. So this has always been a bit of an issue for me and I noticed it becoming worse when I went out to Kenya to migration gravel race. I was in such a flap, I could barely function. I mean, I felt like I was almost gonna hyperventilate uh, with panic because you know, if you watch my channel, that I find um, getting organized quite difficult. I try, I work very hard to be organized, but I still suck at it. Um, so anyway, uh, I was in a real panic at migration gravel race. Um, worried about losing everything, which then made me lose everything, and just generally having a horrible time trying to get to the start line. Once I was cycling, it was fine. But basically, I wanna nip this in the bud. I don't want to uh, not do these thrilling bike races because of something like this, which I feel is kind of irrational. So that's why I'm so interested in the new book and why I want to talk to Mark. So. I have set up a Zoom call, I'm on time, I'm working on my organisation, and uh, I'm gonna go chat to him and see if he's got any tips for me for the Across Andes bike race. And yeah, I'll put a link to the book if you wanna check it out. Yeah, let's go. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for talking to me about the book. 
Um, I've really enjoyed delving into it, particularly because I'm going to be racing my first ultra at the end of the month. Cycling and psychology and mental health is something that's always really interested me because um, obviously cycling helps with mental health for many people, myself included, um, but also because actually I do struggle with the mental side of things a little bit when it comes to doing new stuff. So earlier this year I was racing in Kenya, I did migration gravel race and I got into such a panic before the race that it was like physical. I could just, couldn't keep myself together. I couldn't, I, like, I mean, just getting to the start line was such a nightmare. In fact, that made the right race more fun because once I was racing, I'm like, this is easy. I'm just riding a bike. Um, but you seem kind of cool as a cucumber with all your endeavors. Um, and I wondered if you had any insights on how I could cope with that sort of enormous amount of um, panic that I get into before the start of something. I mean, I think the first thing to recognize is that we're all quite different. Getting an understanding of what your two triggers are, uh, what makes you panic, uh, what puts you in a good state of mind and, and, and not, it is, is pretty useful. And I think that's just giving yourself a little bit of time to think, ah, I'm in that place again. The way you think, the way you speak and your actions in that order, uh, change under pressure. So like that behavioral change under pressure bit is just, it's just having a bit of a mirror on yourself from going, I know that sleep deprivation does this to me. I know that eating the wrong food does that to me. I know that when somebody says something negative to me, it does that to me. You know, having an awareness of how you react under different pressures means you can then start to do something about it and realizing you've got a choice as to, you can't necessarily change your thoughts, but you can change your communications, your body language, your actions. Um, yeah, actually there's some exercises in here that um, help you sort of prepare your own response to situations. Um, so I've only had the book a week and I'm doing the race really soon, but I'm hoping that if I start, you know, following some of the suggestions in here, then I can make even a small difference to how it goes once I get out to Chile. The, the thing is, a book to book, and I hope you enjoy the book, but for it to really work, you've got to sort of make it deeply personal. Um, you know, this has to be something that makes sense for you. So hopefully the book's a useful sort of toolkit and framework, but more is just the way to get people thinking about the way they react in different situations. You want to go to Chile and have an amazing experience. You want to have something which is sort of life affirming, you know, an, an incredibly sort of testing but interesting challenge. Being motivated because of what you're doing, not the comparative success versus the rest of the field. Those are all things which are very, very different than being inspired by the outcome. And I think, I think it's very, very easy for people to go, I want that result, um, you know, without really sort of focusing on what it takes to get it, as opposed to just how amazing it would be to be there at the, at the end. Because I think once you do earn a finish, uh, a record, a uh, personal goal, it always feels very different than the original idea. You know, I never, I never finish, you know, cycling around the world or whatever. I never stand on the finish line and just do backflips and sort of <laughs> do all the thing you think you'll do. You know, you, the, the greatest emotion with completing any of these sort of big bike adventures is relief, heartfelt relief, which doesn't sound very positive. <laughs> but, but it just means that you've grasped it, you've worked hard, you understood the process and not just the outcome. And, you know, you've got pride, you've got pride in yourself, you've got pride in your team around you. It really, it really sort of, you've backed yourself. You, you, you know, you know, you know what it takes to actually deliver on a dream. And that's, I always, I am not the world's best bike rider. And I always say that, I say that in the book, you know, I'm a big lump of a guy, six foot three and 92 kilos. So, you know, my ability to complete these big ultras is, is very much about mindset. It's very much about Definitely. process. It's very much about plan, as opposed to thinking I'm the most, aerodynamic guy with the best, you know, FTP and VO2 max. None of those things are real. You know, what's real is, you know, really good planning, really good process and, and believing in yourself. Absolutely. That makes total sense. Um, so how much time would you spend um, on the mental side, on mental preparation before an event versus, say, physical? Would you devote 
a certain amount of time a week. There's certain mentioned in the book, you know, some breathing exercises and visualization exercises you can do. Do you do all of that or just take bits of it? How do you um, work that into your preparation? Well, the good thing about mental training is it's free. So this is not something you need to, um, you know, you don't need to schedule it like you would an interval session on the turbo or, you know, a, a big training out of the weekend. I would, I would call, you do need to make a conscious choice to work on, on mindset. Of course you do. Um, you know, if you're going to create any change in yourself, whether it's nutrition or, you know, physical ability or good mindset, you need to focus on it. But the wonderful thing about sort of understanding yourself better and working on your psychology is it's something that can be happening all of the time in the background through everything you're doing. You know, when you're preparing dinner, when you're doing your turbo sessions, when you're going around your weekly chores, you can you can constantly, at some level, be checking in on, you know, your thoughts, your reactions, your relationships. And I'm a firm believer that to better know yourself and to work on your psychology is something that it starts with awareness and it starts with sort of checking in very regularly. And it doesn't take a huge amount of time. Like, what are my reactions? Is this relevant? You know, could I do this differently? You know, what am I what am I giving out to the world in terms of my energy and my time? Am I being relevant? You know, so these things are they, they sort of cut across everything that you do. So just being massively aware of what you put out into the world. You know, you you sitting there and saying, I'm excited about next week, but I'm nervous and these things might go wrong. Well that's that's absolutely true. But you might over the next week reframe how you communicate about it. Now I'm not saying those don't things don't exist. But if you don't in some way sort of control it and sort of change the words that you use and build a bit of sort of poise into your process, then that ends up completely overtaking everything else. In the past, I spoke to a therapist and um, she mentioned how important it is not to um, keep saying negative things about yourself. And she referenced um, hypnosis. She said in hypnosis, they'll say to you, you are feeling very sleepy, you are feeling very sleepy, you are feeling very sleepy, and it, and it works like that. So if you keep saying to yourself, I'm very disorganized, I'm very disorganized, I'm very disorganized, then you know, you're programming it into your own head. So that makes total sense that you've got to be careful sort of what you're projecting and what you say to yourself. I will try harder at that. <laughs> it's, it's that old sort of adage, you know, if your dog barks and you shout at it, it barks more because it perceives you as barking. And so the only way to stop a dog barking is actually to speak in a quiet, calm voice and to get it to change its emotional behaviour. You know, we're no different to dogs, we're animals. And, you know, understanding that if you're going to change your behaviour, you need to be conscious about, you know, that sort of internal dialogue. You know, if you think you're a nervous person, you know, that, that will sort of expedite itself, it will, it will manifest more of the same behaviour if you don't somehow sort of control and encounter it. And be a very, very aware of who you surround yourself by. You know, be conscious about the conversations you have. You know, we can't always choose our family and our friends. But, <laughs> but my point is, you know, you do have a, you do have a, a sense of control in terms of, you know, what those conversations are and are they, are they helpful for, for what you're doing or are you just in an echo chamber of, of worry and panic? Mm. Well, that's all very useful and very interesting. Thank you. And I will finish reading the book. Uh, I'm going to take that on the plane when I fly to it's Morocco. It's a pretty scary front cover. <laughs> Some of the photos in here are amazing. I was imagining, are you in a studio and they've kind of like sprayed you with dirt and sweat to try and make it look all sort of intense? <laughs> it was my brief uh, experience of uh, what modeling must be like <laughs> day in a studio getting mud makeup and uh, all sorts of things thrown at me. It was uh, extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks great, and thank you so much for talking to me. Um, I've read so many of your books, so I was actually slightly nervous before I even spoke to you, so thanks for making it all so easy. Oh, wonderful, and like, good luck. Thank have you. A, have an absolute blast. I Enjoy will. Enjoy it, right? Yes. <laughs> thank you. See you later.